All right. It is good to be with you guys today. If you are here in this room, um, congratulations, you made it. Um, I know a lot of you stayed up till 2 o'clock last night watching a football game and uh, fought traffic and a race to be here. So if you're here again, congratulations. It's probably proof that you're saved and you're going to heaven. So that's good news today. We got reason to celebrate. And um, we're continuing our series that we've been calling This Matters. And what we're doing is we're looking at um, some of the reasons why we do what we do as a church. <clears throat> as I've said, <clears throat> excuse me, every re- um, week that I've preached through the series is that I think a lot of times us pastoral types take for granted that you know why we do what we do as a church. Why do we sing? Why do we preach? Why do we do the Lord's Supper? And so that's what this Sunday's about. Last week we talked about the Lord's Supper and how we're called to remember Jesus, we're called to proclaim his death. And we're called to um, remember and have a longing for the marriage supper of the Lamb, that that's what the Lord's Supper does, remembering the new covenant that we have um, through the shedding of Jesus' blood for our sins. Okay, that was last week. And this week, I'm going to talk about baptism. I'm going to talk about baptism. And, and just like the Lord's Supper, <clears throat> baptism is, is something that Christians have been participating in. It's something that they've been doing for For 2,000 years, since just the very beginning in the first days of Christianity, baptism is something we've been doing together. And so if you're new to church, what I want to do just very quickly is I want to start the sermon off by just giving you a quick definition of what baptism even is. And so baptism is when a person trusts in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. When they make the decision, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a follower of Christ, and then the Lord um, imparts on them his righteousness. You're forgiven of all of your sins. You're restored back into your uh, right relationship with God that you were created for. Um, when that happens, that the Scripture shows us and even commands us, Jesus does, to that the next step is to be baptized. And what baptism is is when um, a believer is immersed in water, and then they come out of that water as a symbol of their death to sin and them rising again to walk in a new life because of the person of Jesus. In other words, here's what baptism is. Baptism is a public proclamation. It's a public display of an inward reality that you've been saved by Jesus. That's what, that's what baptism is all about, is you publicly proclaiming, making a public profession of your faith of what Jesus has done for you. Now, <clears throat> I thought a long time about how to kind of preach this sermon, and I thought about going to a specific place in the Bible and just kind of doing it verse by verse, which is what I normally do. But the problem with that approach for the subject of baptism is that if I did that, if I just took one section of Scripture, then I think it would leave a lot of unanswered questions. Um, I've been at the Stone since 2002. Um, I guess that's 14 years, and I was thinking about it. I was thinking about if I had to make a top 10 list of, of maybe the top 10 questions that's been asked of me as a pastor or have been asked um, of us as a church, what would they be? And, and baptism, specifically questions about baptism would probably make the top five. Um, number one, probably the number one question I've been asked in that time as it, when I've been kind of a lead pastor type guy, it would be about election. Um, I'm not talking about the election of 2016. I'm talking about election, whether, whether you choose God at your salvation or if God chooses you at your salvation. Um, number two would probably be, unfortunately, divorce. You know, when can a person get divorced? You know, can they get remarried? What are the conditions, the, whether or not they can get divorced? Um, number three would probably be about money. Um, you know, am I supposed to tithe? Do I have to tithe? What does the tithe look like? And then number four uh, would be baptism would be baptism. It's, it's, it's historically and still is today a subject of a lot of debate among Christians. You know, how, um, how should a person be baptized? It's been, been talked about for centuries. Who should be baptized? You baptize infants. You baptize just believers. Um, is, is baptism necessary for salvation? There's a ton of questions. And so that's what I'm going to do today. And instead of <clears throat> just preaching again through a single text, I'm going to kind of take this sermon to answer a few of those questions. Now, it's a little bit different sermon if you've heard me um, throughout the years. I, I, the sermon at the end of it, I promise you, is very short. One, and number two, you're not going to walk out of here being like, woo, ripping your clothes off, like charge hell with a water pistol kind of thing. It's just kind of didactic. I'm just kind of teach a little bit, um, kind of like a seminary class almost. And so the idea being 
is that if you are a, if you're a believer and you have been baptized, that you'll leave here today, you'll have a deeper understanding of what took place in that moment when you were baptized. And then if you're a believer here that's never been baptized, that you would walk out the doors and one, you would understand what baptism means, and two, is that you would be compelled to take that step of obedience and go ahead and do that. All right, so that's what today is, short message. Let me just jump in <coughs> with the first question. And I want, the first one I want to answer is this. Um, and I've been asked this numerous times throughout the years. And the question is, should baptism be done by immersion? In other words, is, is the proper biblical mode of baptism for a person to be dunked underneath the water or immersed in water? Or is it okay if a person's baptized by sprinkling or by pouring? And um, before I jump in and kind of jump in the Bible and answer that question, I want to show you a real quick video of, of this pastor. He's a former uh, wrestler that has taken baptism by immersion to a whole nother level. Just for fun, let me show you this real quick. Great, I'm going to do that the next time. I'm just going to grab your face. Bam! No, I love that. I think the guy believes in baptism by immersion. But, but here's the thing. I, <coughs> the question is, is it okay? Like, is it biblically permissible um, to baptize by other modes than what we just saw our, our brother, uh, I think his name is Pastor Kev, if you want to look it up, what he is doing there. Now, some of you guys are probably younger or maybe you're new to church and you're probably, <coughs> you're probably thinking to yourself, well, what does it matter? I mean, who cares if a person is baptized by, by dunking them or if you pour some water over them? Who cares? What does it matter? But the, the thing you understand, and I'm not going to go into all the reasons just for the sake of time today, but this has been a subject of debate in the church literally for centuries. For centuries, people have been arguing about this and debating it. And, and not only, I think, is it um, a subject of debate over the centuries, but it's been kind of a, a historical question in our own church. You know, one of the things that's really cool about our church, and I love this, and I never foresaw this happening, is when we started the stone, I, I was amazed at how many different uh, people came from so many different backgrounds. I grew up Baptist, and so I, I, was, um, I was baptized at eight by immersion. I'll talk about that just for a second at the end of this message. But when we started the stone, I just kind of in the back of my mind thought, well, a bunch of Baptists will show up, and they didn't. We had, we had Catholics that were showing up, and we had folks from Methodism and Episcopalian church and, and Bible churches, and we had our favorite people, which are people that have never been to church before because you don't have any baggage at all. Now we're there. We loved you. You were coming. But then all these questions about baptism were coming up. People were telling me, Matt, I was baptized as an infant, but I've never been baptized as a believer. After I made a public profession of faith, do I need to get rebaptized? And then maybe even more than that, <clears throat> I was asked the question, okay, Matt, I was baptized as a believer. Um, let's say at 14 years old, I made a profession of faith. I trusted in Jesus, and I was going to a different denomination church, and so they, they sprinkled me, should I get rebaptized? If I, if I was baptized as a believer, but I was sprinkled. And, um, and so those questions have been asked of us for a really long time, and so... I want to give you a couple of the main reasons why we as a church believe that you should be baptized by immersion. And number one is just from what the word itself, what baptism itself means. Baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo. That's the, that's the Greek word in the original language the New Testament was written in was baptizo. And it literally means immerse in water. That's what the word itself means. It means to dunk or to immerse in water. And even in um, ancient uh, Greek and other non-biblical sources, that's the literal meaning of the word. And so that's just kind of step one. That's what the word means. Now, <clears throat> step two, one of the reasons we believe that a person should be baptized by immersion is that every single instance in the New Testament, I mean, every single solitary time that you see baptism take place, the person is being baptized in the water. And so let me look at several scriptures here. You can follow along if you want to. If not, we'll have them on the screen. But in Mark chapter 1, verse 5, um, John the Baptist is about to baptize Jesus. And I want you to listen to what it says in verse 5. It says, all the, And all the country of Judea 
And all of Jerusalem were going out to him, that's John the Baptist, and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now look at the word in. That's a word in the original Greek, in, that means in, right? And so he was not near the Jordan River. He was not beside the Jordan River. Um, he was not, uh, you know, around the Jordan River. That word means he was inside of the Jordan River. And so it's crystal clear, John the Baptist, when he baptized people, got in the River Jordan and baptized them, all right? <clears throat> Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 9. This is when Jesus was actually baptized. In verse 9, it says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth, of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And in verse 10, it says, and when he came up out of the water, when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn and the spirit descended on him like a dove. And so, I mean, it's just crystal clear. Jesus himself was baptized by immersion. And one other just biblical story, it's Acts chapter eight, verse 35. This is the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. And so Philip, was cruising along, sees this Ethiopian guy, stops, tells him about Jesus. They got trust in Jesus right there on the side of the road. And here, watch what happened. Acts 8, 35. So then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told them the good news about Jesus. And so he tells them the gospel. And then in verse 36, is, is as they were going along, <coughs> they rode, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And so after this Ethiopian unit gets saved. Um, the Bible says they kind of took off, and then when they came upon a body of water, they stopped, they got out, and they baptized this guy. I mean, you got to think that they probably had water in the chariot. They probably had water because they were journeying, and it never crossed their mind, hey, you just got saved. We can sprinkle this on you. We can pour some of our water on you. They stopped and got baptized once they saw a body of water. And so we, we really do believe that just Fundamentally, the biblical, at least, the biblical standard for baptism is that that be done through immersion in water. Now, that kind of begs the question, um, should you get rebaptized? Should you get rebaptized is if as an adult believer, as an adult believer, you were baptized by some other means than immersion? That's the question that I've gotten a bunch. Okay, Matt, I got baptized some other way. Do I need to get Rebaptized, and the and the answer that I would give you is I probably would, I probably would. Um, you're not in sin. <coughs> you need to hear that. You're not in sin if you don't. Okay. Um, there there will be people out in the world that will tell you you are. They're wrong. You're not in sin if you don't. You're not going to hell if you don't. But I would, and here's why I would do it. I would do it mainly because of what baptism is supposed to symbolize when you're actually doing it. When, when, you're, when you're being baptized, that is a symbol of something. It is a picture of something. I want you to listen to me very, very carefully, okay? Um, the water part of your baptism, okay, the actual physical water, it, has a, it symbolizes your cleansing of sin, okay? So the water symbolizes cleansing of sin. But, listen, it's the immersing in that water and then coming up out of the water that symbolizes your death to sin and your rising to a new life in Jesus Christ, okay? And so, if you were only sprinkled with water and you never came back up out of the water that you were immersed in, that, that picture of your death to sin and rising to a new life in Jesus is a part of your testimony that your baptism never got to show. Does that make sense? And so you can't forget, your baptism is an outward picture of an inward reality. It's an outward picture of an inward reality. And so if you were only sprinkled by water, you were only displaying half of what happened to you at your salvation. Yes, you were cleansed of your sin, but you also are now dead to your sin and have risen again to walk in the newness of life in Jesus. That's a picture your baptism didn't show if you were just sprinkled. So for me, just me, myself, I probably would. If I had been baptized as a 13-year-old kid and sprinkled, I would be rebaptized. okay? So that's kind of the first question. Here's another question, an important one, that I want to address, and it's this. Is baptism necessary for salvation? Is baptism necessary for salvation? <clears throat> and this is kind of a big one because some denominations out there believe that you must be baptized 
or you're not going to heaven. That if you trust in Christ, that's great, but there must be some water that hits you at some point in time or you are not going to heaven, all right? There's others believe that the, that the act of baptism itself is actually what saves you. That's where the Catholic Church, um, that's why they started baptizing infants. Is they, they started baptizing infants by sprinkling, one, because they didn't want to dunk a, a baby, um, but two, they believed that putting water on a child is what actually brought about spiritual regeneration in that child in case they died before they had the chance to make the decision themselves, um, they would baptize them. And so, very important question, does baptism cause salvation? Do you have to be baptized in order to be saved? And the answer is no, you do not. And I want to show you why. There's two main reasons. Turn with me quickly, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. I want to talk about why you don't have to be baptized um, in order to be saved. I'm going to add this real quick. I didn't talk about it in the first service, but uh, so I'll give you three. One of the obvious ones is the thief on the cross. You've got, you've got the thief on the cross that looks at Jesus and says, Jesus, I deserve to be here. You don't. Um, we're getting what we deserve. You're a righteous man. And he said, Jesus, will you remember me when you enter into your kingdom? And then Jesus looked at him. You remember what he said? He said, truly, truly, I say to you, today, today, you will be with me in paradise. All right, Jesus did not magically take them both off the cross, dunk the guy in some water, and then get back up on the cross. The guy went to heaven, all right? So that's kind of step one. <clears throat> but here's the other main reason. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. <clears throat> Paul is speaking here, and he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. That's a key phrase right there. This is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. All right, so, so right then and there, we could just stop right there, and that answers the question. How does, how does the scripture say that you and I are saved? He says by grace. It's by grace. The word grace means an unmerited gift, okay? It's an unmerited favor. You are not saved because you deserved it. You are not saved because you earned it. The scripture right there, you are saved, made righteous, made holy, forgiven of your sins as a gift of God. And then he goes on. He goes, by grace through faith. Okay, faith is believing in something that God has already said or done. That's what faith is. And so God, at some point in time, <coughs> went to work in your heart and started changing you and, and, and calling you and wooing you. And then he, through the, through the gift of God, he gave you grace. And then you believed. You had faith in what he said about Jesus on the cross. And then you were saved. You, for, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. And just in case that didn't settle it for anybody, look at verse 9. <clears throat> he said, this is not a result of works. This is not a result of works. This is nothing you did to earn this, right? So Paul is saying to us, the Bible is absolutely clear, you're not saved, you're not going to heaven because you kept the Ten Commandments. You're not going to heaven when you die because you did more good than you did bad. You're not going to heaven when you die because you took the Lord's Supper rightly. You're not going to heaven when you die because you confessed all your sins to some priest. You're not going to heaven when you die because of baptism. Paul is, is crystal clear. The Bible is crystal clear. You are saved by grace through faith, period. End of sentence. All right? Y'all with me? Now, a couple of just little quick historical notes. <clears throat> this is a subject that... Um, Biblicists have been fighting since the beginning of the Christian church. Paul wrote the book of Galatians to fight this heresy right here. The book of Galatians is, was, was written because um, these Jewish folks were getting saved. They were coming to Christ, but they were like, man, we probably need to get circumcised because circumcision is a picture of the covenant we have with God. And Paul is raising his hand and saying, nope, we got a new covenant with God. It is not by grace through faith plus circumcision. It's by grace through faith, period, right? That's the book of Galatians. Now, the Protestant Reformation, 16th century, same thing. The Catholic Church came out and they said, look, it's not by grace through faith alone. It's by grace through faith plus Lord's Supper. By grace through faith plus baptism. And Martin Luther starts shouting from the rooftops, 
You guys have lost your mind. That's not what the Bible said. It is by grace, through faith, plus absolutely solitary nothing. By grace, through faith, you're saved alone. And so he nails some thesis on a door, and the Protestant Reformation breaks out because everybody started reading the Bible for themselves and realizing they can have a relationship with God by grace, through faith. And you and I are sitting here today because of it, which is pretty cool. Told you this was going to be like a seminary lesson, all right? <coughs> Your baptism is a public display of an inward reality that Christ has changed your life. It's not what changes your life, okay? And so that's kind of the main reason, um, by grace through faith alone. Last reason that baptism is not necessary for salvation is, I think, the example that Jesus gave himself of baptism, all right? Um, think about this. Did Jesus need to be baptized in order to be saved? Right? If, if, if baptism is necessary for salvation, as some say, did Jesus get baptized because he needed salvation from sin? Well, the answer is absolutely not. Okay? Um, Jesus was 100% sinless, and therefore he did not need to be forgiven of his sins because he didn't have any sins that needed to be forgiven. So that's not why Jesus got baptized. Now, but that kind of leads us to a question, is why did Jesus get baptized then? I mean, have you, ever, have you ever stopped for just a minute, like in your journey, in your walk with Jesus, and stop for a second and think, why did Jesus get baptized? Like what, he never had a moment of salvation because he was sinless, so why did he get baptized? And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read his baptism to you, and I want you to listen to it carefully because it answers the question, and that answer is important to us. Here's, here's why. Because why Jesus get baptized ultimately leads us to the answer of why you and I need to get baptized. All right? Now let's read this. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan. <clears throat> That's a river. Coming to John to be baptized by him. Now let me stop right there and say this one thing. If you remember the verses we read earlier, this was not John there by himself John was baptizing a ton of people. Everybody from Judea and Jerusalem was coming down and being baptized by John. They heard about this guy. They thought he was a, a prophet. They thought he was Elijah. They had come back. And so everybody was like, sweet, let's go check out this John the Baptist guy. So they were all coming down there, repenting of their sins, confessing of their sins, and, and trying to get right with God. And so he was baptizing everybody. So there was a huge crowd that was watching this. Remember that. And John arrived from the Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. In verse 14, but John tried to prevent him, John tried to prevent Jesus, <clears throat> saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and, 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 and do you need to come to me? So that's a, that's a pretty valid argument by John. John the Baptist knows exactly who Jesus is. He was his first cousin. He was the dude that leapt in the womb when Mary came walking in when she's pregnant with Jesus. Johnny B. knows who Jesus is, and Jesus comes walking up, and John the Baptist says, hold up for just a second. Um, I don't need to baptize you. I know who you are. You're the, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You, you don't need to be baptized. If anything, my man, you need to baptize me. And then watch what Jesus says in verse 15. He says, but Jesus answered him and said, permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he permitted him. And so Jesus looks at his cousin and said, listen, man, we have to do this because there's something that I'm trying to accomplish by my baptism. Because you got to let me do this, man, because there is something we're, we're doing here through my baptism. And in verse 16, he says, After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son in whom... I am well pleased. That, that had to be a crazy moment for all these people that just showed up thinking they were going to hang out with John the Baptist, and all of a sudden this guy who they have no idea who he is. Think about that. They don't have a clue who this guy is. He just came walking up, and all of a sudden John says, hey, dude, you don't need to get baptized with me. I, you should be baptized, you know, I, whatever. And anyway, they're like, this guy gets in the water. John baptizes him. Heavens open up. God starts talking. Now, let's, let's, let's dig into that for just a second. 
did you know that, that at this moment, at this moment right here, the, the, what, what makes this so significant is a couple of things. Number one, it's one of the few times in all of the Bible where you have the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and they all show up at one time. It's just one of a handful of times in all of Scripture where you get the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and they're all there at once. It's called a triadic verse. It's where the... It's why we have our theology of the Trinity. It's because they all show up at the exact same place at the exact same time. You've got the, the sun in the water. You've got the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. And you've got God the Father that starts talking and says, this is my son and who I'm well pleased. So that's one. It's a significant moment because it's a triadic verse. And two, <clears throat> and I could give multiple examples of this, but I'll give you one. Did you know that in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus' birth is only mentioned twice. Jesus' birth is only mentioned twice. Matthew and Luke talk about Jesus' birth. Mark and John don't even mention it. The birth of Jesus is pretty significant, amen? It's Christmas for crying out loud. And they don't even, two of them don't even talk about it. But all four of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four of them mention Jesus' baptism. What is so critical about this moment that Jesus looks at his cousin and said, man, we have to do this. What's so significant about this moment that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all show up at the exact same place at the exact time. What's so significant about this moment that all four of the gospel writers, inspired by the Holy Spirit, were like, we have got to put this down on paper for the world to know. All right, what, what's going on? And here's the answer to the question. And I'm going to use a phrase to answer the question that the world is kind of corrupted, so I just want you to get past that, move past that, and understand what I'm trying to say. What makes this moment so significant, triadic verse, um, you know, all the gospel writers writing about it, Jesus is saying, I've got to do this, is because this was Jesus coming out party. This was Jesus coming out party. This was the moment in time when he revealed to the entire world world, anybody that was watching and listening, that he was the son of God. It was that moment right there. You think about it. Jesus, miracul all, this, all the miraculous stuff at his birth, nobody even knew about that kind of stuff. I mean, think about it. There was only a handful of people in the entire world that knew all the cool, crazy stuff that happened in his birth. You had a handful of shepherds they knew, but this is 30 years later, so they're, they're probably dead. You had some wise men. They knew about the miraculous birth of Jesus. <clears throat> but 30 years later, they're probably dead. You had Jesus' parents, but more than likely, Joseph is dead at this point. And so up until Jesus' baptism, where the Spirit's descending and God starts talking, nobody really even has a clue up to that moment. And so really, guys, that's, that's kind of fascinating when you think about it. You kind of, I, 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 I literally, I've, I've thought about it at Christmas before, but I've never thought about it in this light God came to this planet and lived for 30 years on this planet in absolute obscurity. Have you thought about that? This is, this is the God that created the heavens and the earth. This is the God of the universe. This is the great I am, the Alpha, the Omega, the one that's always been. He was not created. He was eternal. He's everywhere, all the place, all the time. He's all-knowing, and what he did God came to this world, this earth, right here, and he came as a baby, and he hung out for 30 years kind of in the shadows. I, I've been to Israel before. <clears throat> I've seen Nazareth with my own eyes. I want you to get small town out of your mind. I'm not talking about Athens, Texas, small town. It is a, it's a little bitty tiny village on the side of a hill. You can see where it starts. You can see where it ends. It's about 200 yards long. The God of the universe hung out for 30 years at about a 200-yard space right there. Hanging out with his family, doing some carpentry work, reading the Bible, until that day. Until that day. But that, that day, he came walking out of the shadows. He came walking out of obscurity. And he walked up to a really big crowd, and his cousin said, hey, everybody, stop for just a second. I want to introduce you to somebody. This is the Lamb of God that's going to take away the sin of the world. And then Jesus stepped into the water. He stepped into the water. He 
comes down into the water and he comes back out. The Spirit of God descends. The Lord starts talking. Hear this. <clears throat> what was so critical about this moment when Jesus was baptized, listen, is in a lot of ways this was Jesus' very first sermon. Okay, and that's, that's huge. This was the very first message that Jesus gave the world. Think about that. He's been hanging out on the side of a hill for 30 years. He comes out. This is his message. And what was this message that he gave to the world? His very first sermon, it was simply this. I'm going to get down into some water, and I'm going to come back out of that water. And the reason that I'm doing that is I am preaching and I am proclaiming to the world that there is coming a day really soon that I am going to die for the sin of the world. But that's okay. Three days later, I'm not going to be dead anymore. I'm coming out of the grave and I'm going to conquer sin and death so that anybody <laughs> that believes in me, they too can die to their sin and rise again to walk in the newness of life. Jesus was baptized to proclaim to the world his identity as the son of God. It was his coming out party. He's, he's saying, I'm the son of God. And that's why if you're a believer and you've never been baptized, that reason right there is absolutely why you should be baptized. For the exact same reason that Jesus was baptized. Because when you are baptized, you are not receiving the forgiveness of your sins. When you get baptized, you are seizing the opportunity to preach to the world your very first sermon. Your baptism, my baptism, is a sermon that every believer in this room, in the sound of my voice, is called to preach. So you think that guys like me are the only ones that are called to preach. It's not true. Every single believer in this room is called to preach, and this is the sermon that you are called to preach. Jesus said, if you deny me before man, then I will deny you before the Father. But if you proclaim me before man, I will proclaim you before the Father. And when, the, when you trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this is your opportunity to proclaim Jesus to everyone. It's the sermon that every single one of us in this room is called to preach. I have been buried with Christ. And through him, I will rise again to walk in the newness of life. Um, I debated to tell this story um, because there's some probably some theologians that would argue with me whether or not this was improper, but I was rebaptized as an adult. The first time I was baptized was when I was eight years old. I really believe that my salvation was genuine. I remember as an eight year old realizing that I, I needed to be forgiven of my sin and felt Jesus call me to himself. But then through junior high and high school, in the first part of college, just ran away from him completely. And and you, I've told this story before, and came really started following Jesus in college and really walking with him. And then got into ministry and then always wrestled with whether or not I should be rebaptized because I, did, I didn't I did really have a clue what it meant. I had no idea the purpose of it, which is I am proclaiming to the world this message that I've died in my sin. I'm walking with him. and. Um, and even if I had, I, I didn't do it. <laughs> and so um, I went to Israel. I was with my wife. I was with uh, Halim, our pastor that preaches here a lot. And, and it was 2006, and we had driven down to the Jordan River, down below the big mountain that Jerusalem is on top of, and Galilee's the other way, and the Jordan River's right there. And it's just exactly how you imagine it. There's a desert. It is just dry desert, and then there's some green trees that kind of snake along, and that's the Jordan River. And we went down there to check it out, and, and you know it's somewhere between here and here that Jesus was baptized because that's right down there at the bottom where Jerusalem, the road from Jerusalem feeds into it. And I don't remember how this happened, but at some point in the little journey there, Halim and I look at each other and like, 
we got to do this, man. We're at the Jordan. We got to do this. And so we got down into the Jordan River, and there was all these tourists, man. They were all these tourists. We were just standing around watching us. And we got down there, and my wife got in there with us, and, and Harlem started. And Harlem, being the good five-point Calvinist that he is, he started and said, I just want everybody to know that God chose me from the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before his sight. And he kind of did his thing, and, and then I got in, and, and I said, you know, I, I've been a Christian, but I just want everybody here to know that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and he has forgiven me of my sin by the blood of Jesus I'm going to heaven when I die, not because of what I've done, but because he did for me. And then my wife and Halim baptized me. And I think a lot of people, you know, a lot of theologians might say that was unnecessary. Um, but it was just a sermon that I had to preach. Y'all know what I'm saying? It's a sermon I had to preach. And I've had a lot of people over the years say, Matt, I, I know baptism doesn't save me, so what's the point? He said, Matt, I know that, that I'm already forgiven of my sins, and, and so this feels just kind of like a waste of time. I've had people tell me that, you know, look, I'm, I'm, I've, I've been saved, but I'm, I'm embarrassed, or I don't like getting in front of people, and they've given all these reasons why they don't want to be baptized. But I'll end this message by saying, to you, saying this to you. If you're a believer, if you're truly a follower of Jesus Christ, if your sin has really been forgiven by Jesus, what could be more important than you proclaiming that before man? So that one day when you die, he will proclaim you before his heavenly father. That's why we do it. All right, let's pray. Father, I just want to begin this prayer by saying thank you for saving me. Thank you for pursuing me relentlessly ever since I was a little boy. It is my great pleasure, Lord, to proclaim you before man. It's my great honor. And Father, I ask if there's anybody in this room that has never been baptized, they're a believer in you, they're a follower in, of you, they've, they've, they've trusted in you as their Lord and Savior, but they've never taken that step of obedience, I pray that you would put a passion in them today to preach that message. I pray they wouldn't rest well until they, they preach that message in front of their family, their friends, their coworkers. They would go down in the water and come back out and proclaim that they've been buried with Christ and they've risen again to walk in the newness of life. We love you, Jesus. It's a great honor to preach that message to the world. And so it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, you can stand.